Okay, so AMD has uh, launched a new entry-level card. Um, no Halo card from their lineup, so maybe this one will be a little bit more positive. Let's go ahead and talk about some AMD news here from CES because, uh, you know, I would say this is usually like, yeah, rooting for the underdog, the underdog, but AMD is absolutely not an underdog, so let's talk about it. Build Redux creates PCs for gamers who want high frame rates without breaking the bank. Through Build Redux's website, easily configure your PC and see how it's optimized for PC gaming performance. It is Build Redux's goal to create the best gaming PC for any budget without cutting corners on the gaming quality and performance. Plus, it's backed by a two-year parts and labor warranty so you're covered. Pick your budget, pick your games, and get Build Redux. All right, 6500 XT. Um, it's funny because the interesting thing about low-range cards is you... you <laughs> The number might be higher, but sometimes a previous gen card will outperform it for the same price or less, depending. So it's always interesting because there's, there's always an overlap. Like if this is the bracket of the new cards and that's the bracket of the old cards, they're never gonna be like this. They're always gonna be like this. So you, when you're in that overlap area, that's where it starts to become a little difficult to shop sometimes. And just because a brand comes out with a brand new low-end card doesn't mean because it's the newest generation that it's gonna be the best option for you. So the only reason I'm even mentioning that is because one of the things they talked about with the 6500 XT and specifically in a non-tech site is that it, uh, it competes with and, and like beats the RX 570. Now the RX 570 came out years ago. And we're talking like that was around like the Pascal era in terms of Nvidia. So we're talking 20, later than 2016, but four or five years ago now in terms of when it was relevant. Because since then we had RDNA, which was a 5,000 series cards, RDNA 2 obviously, which is 6,000 series cards. And AMD kind of has a longer period of time between their new range and new family of cards than you tend to see with Nvidia. Nvidia kind of has a pretty traditional cycle that they sort of stick with. And AMD, because there's been, there was a lot of turnover in the company, they had the loss of Raja who moved over to Intel and then they had to bring in a new team and then kind of redirect the ship because that was after the whole Vega fiasco. There was a lot of things that had to happen to get AMD back on the right track. And the fact that they've changed course, you know, pivoted, got the new team in there, and then now we are where we are with them is actually nothing short of uh, amazing in terms of the, the, what Lisa Sue's been able to do for the company. 6500 XT though, if we compare it to the 5500 XT, which is the previous like same generation tier, uh, it's a pretty big jump. Now in terms of ROPs, it's the same at 32, but the clock speed, RDNA 1 was close to hitting 2000 megahertz and it would go like 2100 megahertz around there before it would start crashing when you talk about its turbo clock or its auto boost clock and then if you do manual overclocks. The clock speed jump between RDNA 1 and RDNA 2 is insane because AMD is on the cusp of hitting 3000 megahertz with the TSMC um, process. So it's interesting because the 6500 XT is so much faster than the 5500 XT, even though it has significantly less stream processors, 1024 or 16 CUs versus 5500 XT's 1408 and 22 CUs. See, more CUs does not, comp does not relate to better performance if the clock speed is super slow. Now, it's not just the clock speed, though. There's a lot of other things that have to do with the process, the memory, and all that sort of such. But the fact that you can get a faster card with less hardware, technically, getting it done in terms of the, like the stream processors, shows that there's a massive improvement in not just efficiency, which obviously power efficiency, but the amount of uh, cycles and the amount of performance you can get out of those clock speeds. So, gain clock of 2610 and a boost clock of 2815. Now, these are not fully confirmed yet, but this is, this is what uh, um, a non-tech is actually putting down here on their specification um, comparison. So if a non-tech says it, I believe it. 2815 versus the 5500 XT's 1845. So you can see right there, a thousand megahertz bump in clock speed. That obviously makes up for the less stream processors, but each stream processor is more powerful than the previous generation, and that's what matters here. Um, only a 64-bit memory bus though. 128-bit bus on the 5500 XT, 64 in this, four gigabytes of VRAM though versus eight gigabytes. And that is where you're gonna, that's, this is where I start to mention, sometimes it's worth shopping in a previous generation's card if the speeds are comparable with a higher tier last gen versus a lower tier new gen. Again, it's that overlap range, that, that, that gray area. Four gigabytes, that's a, little, that's a little low for today's titles. 
depending on the resolution that you're playing with. If you're playing at 1080p, which is where these cards are really aimed, it's probably gonna be okay, but you'd be surprised how much memory a game can request these days, even at 1080p. I'm also, also kind of surprised that it's a, a four gigabyte card considering AMD has launched eight gigabytes and up in everything, 6,000 series. So I hope that doesn't end up being a move that kind of hurts them in terms of you know, titles moving forward because you don't want this car to become obsolete in terms of its memory um, buffer size as games progress. Remember, people buy graphics cards and they keep them for two, three, four, five years. And if we're seeing just in the way games like with Cyberpunk and Battlefield 2042 and Halo Infinite and all these, new, all these newer titles that can eat up memory really fast, even Farming Simulator uses a lot of VRAM. So if you, if, if you buy this card now, you might find yourself in a year or two having an issue having to turn down texture resolutions and such because of the fact that you're running out of frame buffer. That's the only thing that really worries me about that card. It's price point, MSRP of 199. It's probably gonna be a $400 card, realistically. <clears throat> it's, it's not unrealistic to just double that MSRP and expect that to be the price. A $400 5600 or 6500 XT is certainly better than playing on uh, integrated graphics or a 1050. It's a hard pill to swallow though, 400 bucks. But it is on TSMC's um, N6. And again, the four, the 400 bucks, that's, that's realistically what I think it's gonna cost. That's unfortunate. Uh, 199, an absolute bargain of a card. I mean, I would, I would throw this card in just about anything and feel comfortable playing games on it. Sure, you're not gonna be able to run it at the high settings. Low to medium, 1080p, no problem whatsoever. Nah, that's the trade-off. When, when you shop at this price point, you can't go, I wanna spend $200 and I wanna max out the settings. That's not gonna happen, even at 1080p. You've gotta start shopping in the higher, the higher tiers if you want that. But the fact that AMD is coming out with a low-end card and not at least at this moment do we see anything that appears them taking that process and then using it to make higher-end cards for more money, this to me is, is an applaud. I would be applauding NVIDIA the same way had they not launched a 3090 Ti right alongside it, knowing there's 3080 adopters out or people trying to get their hands on 3080s, waiting for queues and such that they signed up for, um, only to, because what I feel like, and I know I, I sort of talked about this in the other video, but what I feel like is those that are waiting for a 3080 are just seeing their allocation, like that it takes to make their cards to try and, and catch up in demand, going to the rich. And that's what, and I know, I know that sounds weird because I know a lot of people look at 3080 buyers as rich, but that's just going, hey, this guy's got more money than me, he gets it. And that's, that's the world we live in right now and it really sucks, so. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm really curious as to see how this card's gonna perform. It's only gonna be available with third-party cards. Um, so you got your, your Asus, right, and your, your um, S XFX and, and all of them out there. I'm worried though, because uh, what, what a lot of third parties like to do is take their big old massive coolers and their custom PCBs and slap them onto a low end card and bump the price up 150 bucks. These are not high power draw products. These are not high heat products. There's no reason to throw big giant coolers and custom PCBs and extra power connectors on this. This is just ways to upsell because it's not that expensive for these, manuf these AIBs and manufacturers to modify the PCB, add junk to it they don't need because the price they're increasing it is a lot more than the price it costs for them to put those components on there. Just keep it simple, single fan, dual fan, dual slot, single power cable, eight pin, call it a day. Keep the price reasonable, but the AIBs have already made their choices. I guarantee they're making the super high-end crazy cards that are completely unnecessary because we've seen it entirely every single time they've ever launched a card. They come out with some crazy 50 series cards that 50 series for NVIDIA or 65 or 500 series cards for, for AMD bump the price up unnecessarily. So as a buyer, find yourself just a nice entry-level 6500 XT if that's what you're shopping for, plop it in your system, 1080 games, medium, off, off you go. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Sound off down below if the 6500 XT is in your future, if you're gonna try and get one, or you're gonna try and find NVIDIA's 3050. I mean, those two cards are competing, although the 3050 is $50 MSRP more, which means $100 plus more in real life. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.